Testing turns up no positive cases of COVID-19 at the Pines and Bracebridge. We chat with Gravenhurst Mayor about the upcoming long weekend. And a bit of good news coming out of the bad from the heart of Huntsville. All that and more coming up right now. Welcome to Kojiko News for May 13th. I'm James Bowler with what's happening in your community. As Muskoka appears to continue to avoid any new infections of COVID-19, some more good news comes from a local long-term care home. The District of Muskoka reports proactive testing of residents and staff at the Pines and Bracebridge has not turned up any infections within the residents. This comes as good news as long-term care homes across the province have become a hub of viral spread of COVID-19. This also comes after an outbreak was announced at Muskoka Traditions in Huntsville. However, that one infection discovered has appeared to not spread to other residents or staff. The woman in her 90s confirmed with the infection has been recovering in hospital since. In the meantime, we're coming up on the long weekend and Mayor Paul Kelly is urging everyone to keep it quiet and keep travel to only essential needs. This is traditionally the kind of the opening of cottage season, you know, it's gone on for years and years and years. Uh, and it won't be the same, for sure. It will not be the same. Uh, we know that seasonal residents have been coming up to their places. We know that throughout Muskoka. It's been happening for several weeks now. And and uh, what we what we need to continue to do, and the province is saying the same thing. I mean, if if need be, you know, and you need to do the, the go to the cottage, check things out, and do whatever you need to do there. Um, again, the expectation doesn't change with regard to social distancing and um and you know, small groups gathering in small groups, less than five, you know, those, those things are really, I, I, I know those people, the people that are seasonal residents are, are practicing those in the city. So it shouldn't be any change. In fact, they probably have a little more space to do that here. Um, but uh, there, there will be for sure. There's no doubt about it that there'll be seasonal people that will be coming North. Um, and again, the expectation is that they follow the, uh, the rules and regulations that have been laid down by the province and the medical officers of health. So that, I don't, I don't think that changes. Um, the the really critical piece and the concern I think for many is that there will be large group group gatherings, and that is really a concern um, that uh, that uh, groups gather in large numbers. And uh, so we're we're asking, we'll certainly be asking seasonal people to uh, one to ensure that they follow the expectations of the province. Um, no different up here as it is in the city. And second of all, that they make sure that this isn't an opportunity for getting a whole group of people together for a weekend. Uh, it's just not the time to do that. Um, and and in, in addition to that, it's supposed to be kind of a rainy, not great weekend. And so I said, but it will be a little milder. So I suspect there'll be also the black flies there to greet them. So we haven't seen a whole lot of black flies because it's been so darn cold. But uh, I suspect with the uh, weather this weekend, uh, they'll be happy to greet the seasonal residents. Another thing is that there's a fire ban on as well. So to make sure yes. that you kind of, you, you know, can't have those yeah. fires as well. Yeah, and there's some confusion over that. We discussed it yesterday, at, actually, at district at our at Great Rivers Council meeting. Uh, there's concern about there's a, it seems to be misunderstanding around that uh, with regard to jurisdiction south of the Severn River. So Romera, South uh, Severn Township, and so on, and Oro Medante, they they have uh, el uh, eliminated, I guess, the fire ban, but they were not covered by the provincial uh, mandate. Um, all of the uh, municipalities north of the Severn River were all are all mandated by the province it isn't even a, a local choice to make so that was uh discussed yesterday to make try to make clear to everyone that north of the severn river that fire ban has not changed and there is there is no daytime burning no burning period it's a fire ban so it's really important that people recognize that and again you know it's one of the challenges of a holiday weekend you know people want to have a little bonfire well it's it's not it's not allowed provincially north of the severn river so yeah. Yeah. Okay. And well, let's talk about council as well. Um, yeah. What are some of the things happening in council? Um, you know, just kind of update us on that as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we had our count uh, again, electronic council meeting. It's, you know, it's, it really isn't a great way to, to do business. However, it is the only way we can do business right now. So we did a, another electronic meeting yesterday. 
Um, I would say, you know, one, one of the one of the big things that came up was a code of conduct uh, that we had to deal with yesterday with the integrity commissioner. Um, the information is is contained on the website and uh, in the agenda, so I won't go into that. But it was certainly a new thing for council to have to deal, and and that all came into effect uh, basically last year. January of last year, where all municipalities had to have a uh, integrity commissioner uh, available to investigate um, issues that might surface within each municipality. Um, and so we have one just like everyone else. And so they invest did an investigation that was brought forward yesterday. That was that was certainly a different piece for our council and for staff as well. Um, and then we also extended, as I believe most of the municipalities are in Muskogee, if not all, I believe they all are, extending the tax deferral um, issue, that we, which we had deferred until May 31st, but it's now deferred for another two months until July 31st. So, and I think that's going to be consistent across the, um, about the, across the, uh, the district as well. Um, yeah, so, and then uh, we, I did a um, number of highlights, there were a number of finance related issues last, yesterday, and also, um, did a update on some of the COVID uh, things that are still happening um, and, and recognizing, you know, Samantha, again, we, I was saying yesterday, it's amazing how community groups have come together to support each other during this time. Everything from service groups to invented groups, groups that were never there before, like Co Co Cogian and, uh, um, and the Masketeers. <laughs> you know, we found out yesterday, the Masketeers, for example, they've already made 3,000 homemade masks and there's still a demand for them. So I, it's it pretty, pretty amazing. We're taking our first break, but stay with us for more after this. Welcome back. Recently, Ontario announced a plan to provide iPads with wireless connections to students who may not have reliable internet access at home. However, many school boards, like the Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board, had already moved ahead with their own plans to buy similar devices. Today, Minister of Education Stephen Lachey was asked if the province would be covering the cost of these school boards for the devices they had already purchased. Uh, I obviously appreciate that during a closure period, both things can be true. You could realize savings during that period, and there also could be new costs coming online, especially as we look to prepare for the reopening of school uh, for sure in September. Uh, and so we're going to continue to have uh, open discussions and meaningful dialogue with our school boards, with our educators, with our parents, uh, who have, I think, you know, uh, borne so much of uh, the responsibility over the past weeks. We want them all, and students as well, to have the say. But I guess what I can commit to you today is that the Premier has been clear, we will do whatever it takes to ensure the safety of our, of our people. Our kids come first. These are uh, you know, vulnerable segments of our population. These are our children and grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, uh, and our commitment to them is uh, absolutely clear. We will put the resources in place and the tools and investments required to ensure the safety of all staff, but especially of our kids. Yesterday, Gravenhurst Opera House announced the cancellation of its summer season of shows due to COVID-19 pandemic. I had an opportunity to chat with Gravenhurst Arts and Culture Manager Krista Story about this unprecedented decision. It has been uh, six weeks, I would say, that we have been sitting on the edge of a cliff trying to determine what was happening next and um, you know just as the provincial timelines have been inching forward and we've been inching forward as well and you know the opera house has been closed to the public um, for those six weeks and so we've had to unfortunately come to the very devastating decision to cancel our summer theater season um, this year and uh, for anyone who may not know summer theater in canada started right here in muskoka and uh, this is and the opera house has been a, a part of that history um, for many many years so this would be 86 years this year and so is very devastating for um for all of us at the opera house and of course all the artists and everyone else that has been um that has been involved it's a, a huge employer uh in the summertime and uh and also an economic driver for our small community. We were well, 
down the road in our planning for 2021 already. Okay. However, uh, this you're absolutely right. This does give us an opportunity to shift some things, um, things that we're able to shift anyway. And uh, artists and artist management have been so understanding and so supportive. Um, helping everybody. You know, I speak to my uh, colleagues at the provincial level and also at the national level once per week. And we're all going through all of these uh, different stages of, of grief and mourning, but also planning. And how can we come back with a bang? Um, as venues, we have to be there. These are places that are so important to our communities and also to the artists. If we're not there, where will the artists perform? So, um, it's what will it look like? We don't really know at this point. Um, I think it's really important that we all work together uh, as an industry so that people are comfortable coming into theaters, um, not just ours, but all of the theaters. We're back to the break, but stay with us for more after this. Welcome back. Rushmount Equine Sports in Severn is one of the businesses that has been hardest hit by COVID-19. It has fallen through the cracks in terms of bailout funding being provided by the government. Your TV speaks with owner Heidi Mueller about the lengths she's taking to keep this horse farm from going under. Right now it's the help from the community that's keeping everything going. So we are trying to be creative and try to figure out ways. We are trying to refinance uh, using equity in our home to refinance and make things easier that way. Um, hoping that next year will be normal, you know, maybe. Uh, maybe it'll be normal in six months, I don't know. I mean, nobody knows with the second wave that they're talking about if that's gonna happen or not happen. So a lot of facilities like myself have a lot of schooling horses and the schooling horses are in their keep by doing lessons and camps. And without that, they're still eating, they're still needing their stalls cleaned and they're needing hay put out and water put out and all of that, you know, costs money. And uh, so we're all in that predicament where we, we don't have any revenue streams coming in um, and, and all of us feed off of each other, you know, the other schooling barns come to ours and, and train to go to the bigger horse shows and and none of that is happening right now. Um, particularly here, we did have a horse show in March right before all this happened, um, the first weekend in March, and then we were shut down on the 16th. So our horse show in April, our horse show in May, our horse show in June, as well as our May and our June Trillium shows. Trillium's the next step up from schooling. And you know, last year, I think we had 170 horses on site. So it was, uh, it was a, lot of, a lot of participation from the Georgian Bay Trillium Zone and uh, we normally have a team with pony jumpers that go out to the A circuit shows and qualify for the Royal um, and the CSHA classes. So we have some horses that do the cup classes and um, I don't see that any of that stuff's gonna happen this year. And I mean, the government has a few programs out there but it doesn't really work for us. Um, the CERB does work for some businesses that are incorporated and um, we are looking for um, S some sort of program to come down the chute and um, we're still at a standstill we still don't know where we can fall in so you know I was asked in past how am I going to make this work and we've talked about you know selling some of our horses um, but then you have to buy them you have to buy something to replace that once we start back into work and it's it's not easy to find a school horse that can take a joke they are hard to come by they're amazing animals that teach the young and nervous, you know, maybe not necessarily young, but older nervous people or people that have had, you know, a bad experience on a horse to come back and, and get that confidence. They're hard to find. So when you have one that's amazing, you don't want to sell it. And, uh, you know, they're part of, the, part of the family. If people would like to sponsor a, a school horse, any donation is obviously very much appreciated. But to give you an idea, um, 
the just for the hay alone for a horse for the month is about 175 outside for the round bales to keep a horse outside um, you know there's all the other costs blanketing vaccines teeth floating all those sorts of things we didn't in incorporate into these pricings because obviously they're very low but um, you know to keep the horse fed on hay about 175 and one that's inside on grain and and being turned in and out about 300 again that doesn't include you know a hydro bill uh, the hydro bills in places like this are, are astronomical, um, you know, because we heat the water outside and inside and so on and so forth. We're just playing it day by day at this point. We are just going through the, the works. We're back to the break, but stay tuned for a good news business story coming up next. Welcome back. Well, with many small businesses being forced to close across Ontario due to COVID-19, there's still some that are finding new ways to keep the money coming in and the doors open. Belly Ice Cream in Huntsville is one of those businesses. It's mid-morning and Shelly Westgarth is preparing another batch of her much sought after belly ice cream recipes. Spoiler alert, this is a success story in Huntsville and Ontario. As amid the list of businesses closing their doors for good, Westgarth has seen a huge increase in what used to be the smallest of her earnings, the local purchases. Westgarth says generally the majority of her income used to come from retail with a big reliance on selling product to major hotel chains in Toronto. But when COVID-19 forcibly dried up that market, she was forced to take a chance on curbside orders to keep herself afloat. I think it was April 6th. I uh, went online that night and learned how to do the square little websites that you can put online mm -hmm. and people can purchase your product online. I had never done it before, but I managed to figure it out and um, launched it the next day, just kind of expecting that maybe it's going to bring in, you know, 50 bucks here and there sort of some of my regulars who are, you know, I know will support. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's been, we're 800% up on retail for April. So usually in April, if the weather's terrible, like it has been, you know, we're doing, we might see a couple people a day come in for a cone or a pint, like nothing major. The main operation is manufacturing. Mm -hmm. But I've been literally running laps <laughs> from the curb to the kitchen to the curb <laughs> for days. So yeah, it's been it's been an amazing success. I have been blown away by the shift in Huntsville mindset on really sourcing out local and supporting small businesses. Mm -hmm. Like it's been a real thing. Like people are posting what they eat for dinner on social media and they're talking about where they got their food and everything. So it's been um, insanely supportive. And as a result, like I'm I'm we're fine. We're going to make it through this. We'll be okay. okay. <laughs> so totally owed to Huntsville because it would have been pretty dire. So the big question is, what's the plan if Westgarth isn't able to open her doors and put butts in these seats this summer? I have a sort of a contingency plan. Um, by July 1st, if we're not kind of opening back up again, mm -hmm. we're going to use our front window and start scooping. Like right now we haven't been scooping just because it was too too risky, I think, with yep. getting into, you know, it's very hands-on with scooping. So my thought was, if we get to the point where we absolutely have to in order to sort of save the summer, mm. um, we actually are building a canoe paddle with holes in it. Okay. So I can put the cones, <laughs> <laughs> pass it outside. So we've got a plan. We're probably going to launch that, I would say, towards the end of June, yeah. just as a, a real sort of have to save summer kind of option. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to just go through training the staff on like a different pair of gloves for every customer and masks and the whole deal. So the good news is you'll be enjoying some belly ice cream long after this pandemic has passed. We're back to our last break, but stay tuned for Briar Summers with Muskoka on stage.
While we may not be able to party it up outside this month, there's still plenty of performances to keep us entertained inside. Quarantines from Hunters Bay Radio returns this week with Toronto musician John Brooks. Brooks's music is often characterized as literary, elusive, and emotionally intense and difficult to categorize, born as it is from a broad range of influence and musical incarnations. Find more details on this upcoming show by going to the Hunters Bay Radio Facebook page. Make sure to catch the fabulous Angie Nussie's Facebook Live event this Thursday night at 8 p.m. It's an album release concert and fundraiser for Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital Foundation. Angie is a super talented artist and a familiar face here in Muskoka. Details can be found on her Facebook page. This is a performance you don't want to miss. And get your tickets now for a very special virtual concert from Twin Flames. Twin Flames pushes the boundaries of contemporary folk with indigenous Inuit influenced songs that incorporate both Western and traditional instruments. Tickets are on sale now for this May 24th online concert through Huntsville Festival of the Arts, which gets you access to the private Zoom presentation. If you're still not sure about this amazing duo, here's a bit of what you can expect during the virtual show. You've always been there all the way. You made me who I am today. You believe in me. You believe in me. That's it for this week, but make sure to tune in again next week for some more great virtual shows. That's Kojiko News. For more information on the program, head over to yourtv.tv or connect with us on social media by searching Your TV Muskoka. Remember to watch us live at 5, Monday to Thursday, and from everyone here at Kojiko News. Thanks for watching. Stay home and stay safe.